So there's a guy named Elon Musk, and he has a company, one of the many companies called Neuralink, that has uh, that's also excited about the brain. So it'd be interesting to hear your kind of opinions about a very different approach that's invasive, that requires surgery, that implants a data collection device in the brain. How do you think about the difference between kernel and Neuralink in the approaches of uh, getting that stream of brain data? Yeah, Elon and I spoke about this a lot early on. We we met up, I had started kernel, and he had an interest in brain interfaces as well. And we explored doing something together, him joining kernel. And it, ultimately it wasn't the right move. And so he started Neuralink and I, I continued building kernel, but it was, Interesting because we were both at this very early time where it wasn't certain what if there was a path to pursue, if now was the right time to do something, and then the technological choice of doing that. And so we were both, our starting point was looking at invasive technologies. And I was building te uh, invasive technology at the time. Uh, that's ultimately where he's gone. Uh, a little less than a year after... Uh, Elon and I were engaged, I shifted Kernel to do non-invasive. And we had this neuroscientist come to Kernel. We were talking about, he had been doing neurosurgery for 30 years, one of the most respected neuroscientists in the US. And we brought him to Kernel to figure out the ins and outs of his profession. Mm -hmm. And at the very end of our three hour conversation, he said, you know, every 15 or so years, a new technology comes along that changes everything. He said, it's probably already here you just can't see it yet. And my jaw dropped. I thought, because I I had spoken to Bob Greenberg, uh, who had built uh, Second Sight first on the optical nerve, and then he did a uh, an array on the optical um, cortex. And then I also uh, became friendly with um, Neuropace, who does, who does the implants for seizure detection and remediation. And I saw in their, in their eyes what it was like to take something through an implantable device through for, for, for a 15 year run. They initially thought it's seven years and it ended up being 15 years and they thought it'd be a hundred million is, you know, 300, 400 million. And I really didn't want to build invasive technology. It was the only thing that appeared to be possible. But then once I spun up an internal effort to start looking at non-invasive options, we said, is there something here? Is there anything here that again, has the characteristics of it has the high quality data. It could be low cost. It could be accessible. Could it make brain interfaces mainstream? Mm. And so I did a bet the company move. We shifted from non-invasive to uh, invasive to non-invasive. So the answer is yes to that. There is something there that's possible. The, uh, the answer is we'll see. We've now built both technologies and they're now, you experience one of them today. We were apl applying we're now deploying it. So we're trying to figure out what value is really there, but I'd say it's it's really too early to express confidence, whether it's too, I think it's too early to assess which technological choice is the right one on what timescales. Yeah, Be timescales are really important here. Very right? important. Because yeah. if you look at the, like on the invasive side, there's so much activity going on right now of less invasive, techniques to get at the neuron firings, which what, what Neuralink is building, it's possible that in 10, 15 years, when they're scaling that technology, other things have come along and you'd much rather do that, that then starts to clock again. It may not be the case. It may be the case that Neuralink has properly chosen the right technology mm -hmm. and that that's exactly where they wanna to be, totally possible. And it's also possible that the paths we've chosen are non-invasive fall short for a variety of reasons. It's just, it's unknown. And so right now, the two technologies we chose, the analogy I'd give, to, give you to, to create a baseline of understanding is, if you think of it like the internet in the 90s, the internet became useful when people could do a dial-up connection. And then the paid, and then as, as, as bandwidth increased, so did the utility of that connection and so did the ecosystem improve. And so if you say what kernel flow uh, is going to give you a full screen on the picture of information, so you're going to be watching a movie, but the image is going to be blurred and the audio is going to be muffled. Mm -hmm. So it has a lower resolution of coverage. A kernel flux, uh, our MEG technology is going to give you the full movie in 1080p. 
And Neuralink is going to give you a circle on the screen of 4K. Yeah. And so each one has their pros and cons and uh, it's give and take. And so the decision I made but Kernel was that these two technologies, Flux and Flow, were basically the answer for the next seven years. Yeah. And that they would give rise to the ecosystem, which would become much more valuable than the hardware itself, and that we would just continue to improve on the hardware over time. And, you know, it's early days, so. Uh, it's kind of fascinating think to think about that you don't, it's, it's very true that you don't know, uh, both paths are very prom are promising. And it's like 50 years from now, we'll, we'll, we will look back and maybe not even remember one of them. Mm -hmm. And the other one might change the world. Mm -hmm. It's so cool how technology is. I mean, that's that's what entrepreneurship is. Is yeah. like, mar it's the, the zeroth principle. It's like you're marching ahead into the darkness, into the fog, not knowing. It's wonderful to have someone else out there with us doing this. Because yeah, if you if you look people. at brain interfaces, anything that's off the shelf right now is inadequate. It's had its run for a couple of decades. It's still in hacker communities. It hasn't gone to the mainstream. The room size machines are on their own path, but there is no answer right now of bringing brain interfaces mainstream. And so it both, you know, both they and us, we've both spent over a hundred million dollars. And that's kind of what it takes to have a go at this because you need to build full stack. I mean, at kernel, we are from the photon and the atom through the machine learning. We have just under a hundred people. I think it's something like 36, 37 PhDs in these specialties, in these areas that there's only a few people in the world who have these abilities. Mm -hmm. And that's what it takes to build next generation, have to make an attempt at breaking into brain interfaces. And so we'll see over the next couple of years, whether it's the right time or whether we were both too early or whether something else comes along in seven to 10 years, which is the right thing that brings it mainstream. So you see Elon as a kind of competitor or a uh, fellow traveler along the path of uncertainty or both? It's a fellow traveler. It's like at the beginning of the internet is how many companies are going to be invited to this new ecosystem? Like an endless number. Because if you think that the hardware just starts the process. And so, if you, okay, back to your initial example, if you take the Fitbit, for example, you say, okay, now I can get measurements on the body. And what do we think the ultimate value of this device is going to be? What is the information transfer rate? And they were in the market for a certain duration of time and Google bought them for you know, two and a half billion dollars. They didn't have ancillary value add. There weren't people building on top of the, the Fitbit device. They also didn't have increased insight with additional data streams. So it's really just the device. If you look, for example, at Apple and the device they sell, you have value in the device that someone buys, but also you have everyone who's building on top of it. So you have this additional ecosystem value, and then you have additional data streams that come in, which increase the value of the product. Mm -hmm. And so if you say, if you look at the, the hardware as the instigator of value creation, mm -hmm. You know, over time, it what we've built may constitute five or ten percent of the value of the overall ecosystem, and that's what we really, really care about. What we're trying to do is kickstart the mainstream adoption of quantifying the brain, and the hardware just opens the door to say what kind of ecosystem could exist, mm. and that's why we the examples that are so relevant of the things you've outlined in your life. We hope I hope those things, the books people write the experiences people build, the conversations you have, your relationship with your AI systems. I hope those all are feeding on the insights built upon this ecosystem we've created to better your life. And so that's the thinking behind it. Again, with the Drake equation being the underlying uh, driver of value. And you know, the people at Kernel have joined not because we have certainty of success, but because we find it to be the most exhilarating opportunity we could ever pursue in this time uh, to be alive.